has appeared to all men. It's appeared to everyone. Amen? All men. No one excluded. That's not saying that all men will automatically receive the salvation. It's saying that God made salvation available to all men. Uh Uh-huh. All men who what? All men who place their faith in the one true God and the one, the grace, the kindness that God has provided. Who is that? Only Jesus Christ. Amen. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short against the Holy God. We all deserve eternal death. We all deserve God's wrath. But God sent his kindness. God sent his grace. Amen. To die for our sins, paying for our sins. And since sins now are paid for, we can now be forgiven of the broken relationship. Amen. And have our relationship with God fully restored forever and ever and ever. But again, it's only to those who are trusting in the faith huh? of Jesus Christ, putting their faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. So the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us. Amen. Let's just break it down before we get into it. <laughs> teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. Ah. Teaching us that denying ungodliness. What is that? Ungodliness is rejecting the rule and the lordship of God. Amen? There is no God. I refuse to believe. I'm, I'm just here. I showed up and I'm going to have a great time, try to make the best of my life. I don't have to submit to anyone's authority but myself and maybe the police. <laughs> you follow me? There are people like that, right? We all know them. Amen? Denying that kind of thinking, amen, ungodliness, and denying the rule, the reign of Jesus Christ as our Lord, amen, our master, and also denying what? Worldly lusts. What is that? Not just sexual immorality, but including sexual immorality. Amen? But also, you know, the lust for pleasure, the lust for money, the lust for power, the lust for fame. You know, I want to be incredible to everybody. I want to look good doing it. I want all the money. I want all the power. I want you to think, remember my name, fame. I want to live forever. (laughs) Y'all remember. (laughs) Took some of y'all back, right? (laughs) Remember Leroy and them leotards and, and... Leg warmers, come on. We were all going there. We were all acting. I remember when that movie came out, I was like, I just want to be just like Leroy. Why? Because he was going to be famous. Amen? What is that? He's saying denying worldly lust, power, money, fame. We should live soberly, use wisdom. We should live righteously, holy living. We should live godly, be devoted to God with your life in this present world. Now, I struggle with the first word of this verse, teaching, because there's some verses that come up that were kind of throwing me for a minute when you look through the concordance, and I have this thing called the TSK in my logo software, or my logo, is however you want to say it, software. And, 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 and I was show, it was showing these verses that were kind of throwing me off a little bit. I was like, what does this mean? Is it, you know, when you look at the word teaching, the verses came up like this. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9. I'll just briefly read it and move on. Um, but we don't need to write to you about the importance of loving each other, for God himself has taught you to love one another. Or another one, um, 1 John 2, 27. Um, But you have received the Holy Spirit and he lives within you, so you don't need anyone to teach you what is true. Interesting. For the Spirit teaches you everything you need to know, and what he teaches is true, it is not a lie. So just as... He has taught you, remain in fellowship with Christ. Amen. So the question came to me. is like, well, okay, he's saying that that the grace of God is teaching you to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this world, world, denying uh, lust and denying uh, ungodliness. Amen. But here it's saying, when I look up the word and I see the the corresponding scriptures, it's saying these words about, you know, these verses about you don't need a teacher. So is it 
Really saying we don't need teachers? Because that doesn't make sense, because that goes against what we see in Ephesians 4. When he ascended, let's look at it real quick. When he descended, he gave uh, some apostles and some prophets and some teachers, Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. See it? Some evangelists and pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Why? Because you skip down a little bit lower than that. It talks about so that you won't be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. So what is he saying here? Is it saying that we don't need teachers? No, not quite. Specifically, it's saying that when it comes to holiness, saints of God, we have an internal helper that desires to do what's right already. He's already living inside of you. Are you hearing me? Amen. So doctrine must be taught by others. That's what God has assigned. We have teachers to teach us doctrinal things. You know what I mean? Amen. But you don't need to understand, stop sleeping around and stop smoking and drinking and shooting folks in the Greek. You don't need that. There's a, <laughs> there's a helper inside of you. His name is the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, once you receive Christ, once you get saved, he comes to live in you. He begins to teach you. There ought to be an automatic response automatically that says, you know what? I used to do certain things, but I can't do that stuff so easily anymore because the one who's living inside of me, he's teaching me, he's showing me, he's grooming me, he's shaping me. I don't need you to give me some person to tell me all that. I already know. Girl, cut that out. Come on. Am I right about that, Rick? The Holy Spirit teaches you. Amen? There's some things you used to be able to just do. That's not so easy anymore, is it? Amen? You have the Holy Spirit. So, again, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that uh, by denying un ungodliness and worldliness, thus we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present help. Okay, how do we do that? Teaching us that by denying ungodliness and worldliness, we can live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. How is this done? Well, the next verse, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. What are you saying here, Pastor? One day, saints of God, Jesus Christ is coming back for his bride. The church. The bride is holy. Amen? The bride is pure. Amen. The bride is not some nasty girl. The bride loves her husband. The bride is faithful. To her husband. We ought to be living every single day like our groom is coming. Come on. Come on. This is holiness. And holiness is right. Amen. Like he's coming back for us any day, saints. Amen. How are we going to live in this way to where God is, where Jesus has this thing for us, where he has this mission for us? where he wants us to live out, he saved us for a reason. Well, we look forward to the day when he's coming back. Amen. For you and me. So I don't live for this world. I live for my groom who's coming to get me. Amen. And why would I do that? Well, verse 14, it says, because he gave himself for us that he might, here's the purpose clause, redeem us from all iniquity. That is completing the salvation through the process of sanctification. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And it's not so where we just get saved and that's it. No, he didn't just save you so you can go to heaven. He saved you so you can live holy right here and now. Amen? Redeem us, snatch us back, buy us back from all iniquity, all of the dead works, all of the sinful living. Amen? And purify unto himself a peculiar people. Purify means to not have mixed motives. Don't drink water with dirt in it. Are you hearing me? Pure. 
If I, you come to my house and I show you, give you some water and this thing's just floating. No, thank you. That's kind of like some of us Christians who have all these other agendas on top of what Jesus Christ wants us to do. Woo! Oh, thank you, Lord. That came out of nowhere. Huh? Purify. I want, I want my passions, my desires. Huh? I, gave, I died for you. I gave my life to you. Now you give your life to me. Amen? Pure motive. Purify unto himself a peculiar people. Okay, help me, God. Help me keep this one under control. You're not going to be. Peculiar people are not strange, weird people. Some people, you know, they, they take this out of, out of context. Everything is just deep. Just, just deep, 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 deep. I have some folks in my family. We all have them. They got saved to the utmost in another degree. <laughs> Another level, you know, and they're just deep about everything, you know, working for McDonald's. You know, you go up to them, order a burger from them. You want a Big Mac? Oh, gee. Fries. Just, just too much. You know what I mean? Just calm down. Peculiar people is not looking deep and strange and weird and jerking every time somebody says two sentences. <laughs> You've seen them, right? They just go in on God knows what. You know, what are you doing today? I'm going to buy some paint. Yay! And paint my house in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Too much. Peculiar is not weird. Now, you're laughing because you know you've seen these folks. Peculiar people who are zealous for good works are people who are out of the ordinary. They don't do what everybody else does. They don't respond the way they have, you know, they have a, a zeal about them. That's the word I want to use. Yeah. Zealous for, uh, for good works. It, this is a power or enthusiastic desire to do the will of God. Good works meaning to love others, kindness to others, shown to others. Huh? If the, the grace and mercy that has been given to you flows into you and through you and out of you into the lives of other people. Amen? So you find yourself being generous. You find yourself being loving. You find yourself, you know, doing things for your neighbor. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, how would you, you know, you, you see Christians that serve in a, in a way that's just extraordinary. They're peculiar. You know, we ought to be the best folks on our job. You know, we're, we're, the employers ought to be like, those Christians, I tell you. There's something about them. You know, earlier in this chapter, if you read it, go back, it talks about, you know, people who are, you know, servants, meaning, you know, you are, you have employees, not talking back after your boss has something to say to you. Uh-oh. <laughs> They're peculiar people. They're different, you know. You know, I want to help my neighbor. I see a stranger in need. I do some, there's zeal, I, ooh, how can I show Jesus today? You know, I come from the music business. You know, you got folks that want to do a gospel album. You know, what about, you know, my dad used to always say, go sing in a convalescent home. There are people that need to hear your voice there. They can't buy your album. They're broke. They're in pain. You know, and you're trying to make everybody a fan, but you won't go and sing somewhere where, the, where there's a real need. Think about it. Peculiar people. Are you hearing what I'm saying? There are people that need to hear hope from you. God gave you an ability to sing, and God wants you to share your gift with people that are not, you know, going to be able to buy your ticket. Oh. Because you know, Rick, we saw a lot of that. You know? So here's the thing. Grace came. Jesus Christ came. Kindness came. Huh? Kindness, grace paid for our sins. Jesus Christ paid for our sins. He saved us from going to hell and he gives us a new life. So, here's the question What's the proper response to this mercy that we have received that we know we don't deserve? 
Well, here we go. John 14, 15. Man, I sound like my dad. That's crazy. Weird. Okay, John 14, 15. If ye love me, keep my commandments. Oh. John 14, 23. Jesus replied, all who love me will do what I say. <laughs> my father will love them, and we will come and make our home with each of them. But like that snake, do you have the power to change your own nature? We see how we should respond. It's very clear. But do we have the power to show gratitude? Or are we just used to slithering around? Choking folks. <laughs> Huh? Here's another question. Would, would an all-knowing, all-wise God who knows everything about my holiness track record, would he leave it all up to me to respond to his mercy or would he give me some help? Hmm? Titus 3, verses 4 and 5. Almost done. Just teaching this morning. The Word of God says, but after the kindness, there it is again, the grace, after the kindness and love of God, our Savior towards man appeared. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. Amen? But according to his mercy, he saved us. There's that word mercy. Uh -huh. by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. You and I have some snakish characteristics. God can help me and you out over and over and over and over and over and over again. And the truth of the matter is, if God does not change my nature, I will never, ever appreciate or respond to the mercy of God in the way that is proper. I just can't do it. Israel proved it. Israel would get into idolatry, God would rescue them. A generation would go by, they'd go right back into idolatry, God would rescue them. Another generation would go by, they'd go right back into idolatry, God would rescue them. Then they would have consequences. For their idolatry. God would send in all kinds of armies and nations to completely rule and subdue them and to give them a hard time. Nobody's EBT card is working. It's a mess. Okay? So over and over again, it's just uncomfortable. God, when are you going to rescue? What does God do? Over and over again. Rescue them a time and time again. And what do they do? Go right back to their slithering, choke-holding, snaky ways. Just like you and me. If God does not change my nature, I cannot respond to his mercy properly. There must be a change. So, after the kindness of love of God, our Savior towards man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, not by me giving it my best shot and, 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 you know, making promises that I know good and well I cannot keep with my only human self. Huh? Over and over again. I said I wouldn't do it and I did it again. I did it again. I even cried real good the last time. Oh, God, forgive me. I won't do it again. And I did it again. Huh? Without his righteousness being worked in me, his mercy, according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration. He made me new. I'm born again. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The believer is born again. Amen. And the renewing of the Holy Ghost. There's the Holy Ghost working on you and I 
through a renewal process, getting us to be more and more like Jesus. Are you hearing what I'm saying? 2 Peter 1 and 4 says this, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these, uh, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. You see it? Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So all these lustful things that I would do and all these things. See, before I was working by myself, but now that I have received Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit has come in and regenerated me and started the renewal process and renewing of my mind, I now have a helper, a paraclete that walks along with me, causing me to be more and more like Jesus, who is changing me. Why? Because there's an old nature and now there's a new nature that has been injected into my life. That makes it harder for me to just so easily do what I used to do. Are you hearing me? And that was a gift. I didn't buy it. Are you hearing me? I didn't didn't coach God into it. I didn't come up with, you know, look, look God, what what we need to do is you need to kind of do some things for me so I can live holy. No, I wasn't even asking for it. He just gave it. He gave it. How do you respond to that kind of mercy. Huh? Here's the thing. The grace of God, the kindness of God, affects man's sinfulness and not only gives the repentant sinner uh, salvation, but brings joy and thankfulness to the sinner. So where we end up saying things like this, Psalm 40 and 8, I take joy in doing, wow, your will, my God. Whoa. For your instructions are written on my heart. So what are you saying, Pastor? Grateful, holy living is the sinner's saved or the saved sinner's response to receiving grace. Amen? The rest of our lives. Help me, Holy Spirit are a way of saying thank you every day that I get up. I am not just obligated. I have appropriated and applied and understood what God has done for me. And I cannot help but not just say thank you. I live thank you. You hear that? Every day. You know, the people... You know, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They would say, we love you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. No, God is saying, take that praise in your lips, put it in your hips, and get into them legs where you can start walking this thing out. And how do you do that? You say, thank you every day because I'm not what I used to be, and I have your help, and I know you're being merciful not to leave me like I could have been left before. You did not leave me alone. That is God's mercy. That is his mercy. I was a mess. You was a mess. You didn't put it on Facebook, but we know. The key to subduing the downward drag of sin in our lives is to know the impulse of gratitude. I have an impulse to smack you. I ought to have an impulse that comes up that says I'm grateful for God. And I will not respond that way. I could. My impulse, you said something, and I could come, I can come for you. I'm a preacher. I, got, I know how to use my words. You follow me? But there ought to be another impulse that says, but how grateful and how thankful are you to me for what I've done? Are you hearing me? It's a day of saying thank you every day. What are you doing? I'm living thankfulness. I'm living thankfulness. Amen? The renewal process. Huh? Here it goes again. Uh, Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. This is the least I can do. The proper response to the mercy and the grace that we have been given is to live a life of thankfulness. What do you do? I become a living sacrifice. I lay my life down. 
Why? Because I'm thankful that you took the old one. <laughs> I, could be, I could be stuck in the old one. Selling TVs and anything I can steal out of your house so I can get high. Huh? Some people did go that far, though, Beth. Some people would go to church, take their money, write out your purse, and go get high. There can only be one response to grace. A life of gratefulness. Christ atoning death brought righteousness, righteousness from the law. We were in the law, but now we're in grace. Amen. But because of what Christ did, the law has been fulfilled. Amen. So we're not walking according to the flesh. We're now walking according to the spirit. Amen. The Spirit has given us something that we don't deserve. Amen. And we're grateful for it. The last thing I'll say is this. I'm done. God gets his message of mercy and grace across the nation through his saved people who act like they are grateful. So it should not be that we get in the way of this great message of salvation and grace and mercy by how we live. It should be that when they see us, they understand, what you, why are you living like that? Well, because... <laughs> I used to live in another way. Why, why, why do you respond? How do you respond like that? Well, you know, what I've been given is just too good. I, I, I just can't, I can't take this for granted. I just, I got to say thank you. How are you going to say thank you? I, that's what I'm saying thank you by how I'm living. Can't, that's why you asked me the question. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Every day of the day to say thank you. Every day of the day to respond properly to the mercy of God that we've been given. I'm done. Amen? Amen. Rick, I need you. Real quick. 